Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about the unusual report coming out of NASA that seems to suggest that one of the NASA engineers may have come up with a really interesting propulsion system. And you may have already read an article about this somewhere in one of your media sources, but let's actually talk about the details and whether it's possible. Welcome to Math. You know, a title like this is definitely going to grab attention. I was even thinking of stealing this just for this video. But let's not go this far. Okay, so he might be a NASA genius, but what exactly is David Burns talking about in his presentation about the so-called helical engine? So if you haven't really read the story yet, the idea here is that this NASA engineer proposed an idea that actually has been thought about before, this is not the first time someone came up with it, but in short, he proposed a type of an engine that would not really require any kind of a um, propulsion medium, it wouldn't really need anything to be honest, except for uh, just a few things on the inside, and it would create um, thrust, or it would actually create power, by using Einstein's relativity ideas and by um, employing what's known as the relativistic shift. In short, this particular engine would not have these things. The uh, propulsion here would not be an exhaust of any kind, and instead this propulsion would be based on the following. So in a normal system, this is kind of what you would expect happening if you were to push an object on the inside in an enclosed environment. Basically it sort of wobbles back and forth and doesn't really get any motion done except for just that motion that you see on the screen. So in other words, you can't really make an engine with this. Unless you suddenly start accelerating this part to what's known as relativistic velocities. Now, for the sake of keeping this video a little bit more brief, and mostly because I've briefly talked about some of these concepts in some of the videos above my head, but also because there's going to be another video later on. And so the basic principle here is that as you get closer and closer to the speed of light, there are a lot of things that start happening a little bit differently for you. You may already know about the so-called twin paradox, and this of course refers to the fact that the time for one of the twins traveling closer to the speed of light starts to um, slow down. So when the twin returns to Earth, he or she will actually be a little bit younger than the other twin. But it's not just the time, it's actually a lot of things. It's things like length that also changes, and of course the mass. So here, the faster I move, the shorter my length will become, but also at the same time, the higher my mass will gain. So as you travel closer and closer to the speed of light, the mass of the spacecraft actually goes up dramatically. This is what we refer to as the Lorentz transformations. And as you can see from the second part of the video, where the Lorentz transformation is applied, the uh, transformation here actually increases the mass of the object to the point where it starts gaining acceleration and, um, of course, velocity. And this will continue until the object is moving really, really fast. So in theory, this is totally possible. This is actually a very logical and very solid theoretical model that could technically work. I myself also thought about this engine back when I was studying relativity, but there was a little problem. I really couldn't work out um, where the energy would come from, while at the same time, how much energy you would actually need to um, create such an engine. But unlike other media sources that went as far as criticize this author here, suggesting that maybe he should check his math with his colleagues first before publishing this, I wanted to take a different approach and go through the details of his paper and just take a look at what makes sense and what doesn't. So first of all, the whole box experiment totally makes sense. This is a purely theoretical concept that we know works, and uh, we've been able to prove this many, many times. The Lorentz transformation is something that is a real thing, and we actually have to be aware of the transformation when it comes to satellites orbiting our planet. The GPS satellites, for example, have to constantly readjust themselves and have to correct for the Lorentz transformation because even though they orbit not that far from us, they do experience a bit of a time dilation. But one thing I couldn't figure out and also one thing that um, I was sort of struggling with when I was coming up with this concept years and years ago was, so how exactly do you transfer this momentum without really sort of pushing anything back? So in other words, if I were to 
look at this donut video again, you'd see that it basically keeps pushing back on the box from both directions. And even if I were to accelerate it to great velocities that are essentially close to the speed of light, even at this point, because we're accelerating it with some sort of um, electromagnetic propulsion, very similar to this right here, this is an ion engine that uses electromagnetic propulsion to accelerate positively charged particles and thus move because of this um, electromagnetic repulsion that's created. How would this work for an enclosed environment, um, basically this box with a donut? Well, he actually does propose a pretty brilliant solution, although it's not necessarily practical yet. Instead of having things push back and forth, you would actually have them spin. So a rotating motion would solve all of these problems. In other words, think of it as a spinning finger that you move really, really quickly and then suddenly with all of this force, you push at that one direction of the box. And this would obviously conserve the momentum and prevent the spacecraft from moving in the opposite direction. It would just kind of wobble a bit this way, but it would not move in the direction opposite of where you want it to go. Now, it's a bit unclear right now how exactly this would be attained, because I don't think we have a technology that's able to do this yet, but it's not far from the realm of possible things that we could achieve. Now, okay, so technically this could work, but how about the energy required for all of this? Well, a typical ion engine can actually easily function with solar panels, which is this right here. This is the Dawn probe that uh, was orbiting around Vesta asteroid and then used its ion engine to move to Ceres a few years ago. So we know this is a concept that definitely works. But the solar panels here don't produce anything major. The actual energy produced is definitely not even close to what we need for this type of an engine. And even though the example he provides specifies the energy at roughly around 165 megawatts, which is already a lot, way more than the Large Hadron Collider generates, this nevertheless is not in the realm of impossible. But here he specifies the Lorentz factor of 7.2, meaning that the mass will increase by about 7 times, and the length of this object would be about half a kilometer, um, which is, I guess, not too big, but also not a very small object. But here's my problem though, having done the numbers myself, I don't actually get the same result, especially if we use a mass of about 2 kilograms or let's just say even 1 kilogram for the ease of calculation. So first of all, to double the mass of this object and to basically make it move so that its mass is 2 times more than it used to be, it needs to move at roughly around 86% of the speed of light. And luckily for us, this wonderful person, Russell Rocket, has already answered this question for us. He calculated how much energy you would need to accelerate one kilogram of mass to a velocity of about 90% of the speed of light, which is maybe a little bit more than we need. And the answer to this is 1.2 times 10 to the power of 17th joule. Okay, just to give you a comparison, a typical nuclear reactor produces about 8 times 10 to the power of 13 joules of energy from 1 kilogram of uranium. And that's essentially converting pure kilogram of mass into energy. And that's about 1000 times less energy than previous amount. So basically, it's about 1000 times easier for us to use pure uranium to produce energy than it is to accelerate 1 kilogram to about 90% of the speed of light. In other words, technically, you could use less energy to produce mass and then just throw it out of the spaceship and that would be more efficient than using the strange helical drive that you see right here. But that's of course with the mass of about 1 kilogram. How about using a much smaller amount? Well, in that case, the energy requirements also decrease quite dramatically, but so does the total acceleration. And this is of course where this problem begins, because for this to be a functional engine, we need a tremendous amount of energy, more energy than it would be efficient. Basically, like I said, it's easier to just produce this mass and then throw it out of the window and gain acceleration that way. While at the same time, um, even with smaller amounts, you still need quite a lot of energy um, equivalent to powering a large city. So, Energy is a huge problem with this design and it's going to be almost impossible to overcome this because if we were to use a nuclear reactor to produce this energy, it will be very counterproductive and will very likely be completely inefficient. 
In other words, until we can come up with a much more efficient energy source and a way to produce energy in space way, way better than we do right now, it's going to be a very hypothetical scenario that's just going to be for science fiction. Although so far the theory here does look kind of promising. But anyway, I guess the biggest thing about all of this is that on the one hand, it's really cool that NASA is looking for these alternative engines and is currently trying to figure out how we can possibly create something to take us to the other stars. But on the other hand, I was a little bit sad to see um, a lot of scoffing and a lot of really horrible comments from people, especially the scientific community, that kind of took it as a joke more so than just looking at what he's saying. But this is why I try to do things the way I do them. I just kind of approach it from an open perspective with no biases. And although sometimes I do fail, sometimes it works out just fine. Anyway, on that note, once we actually discover a little bit more about this idea and this technology, and once we possibly even have someone build some sort of prototype, we'll talk about this in some of the future videos. For now, that's it. Thank you for watching. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Space out, and as always, bye-bye. And by the way, I know someone will ask this in the comments, but this spaceship here is from Space Engine. Go and check it out. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.